one of the wonderful experiences one can have as a parent is finding out that one of your children is interested in one of those old things that you used to like. Uh, I was actually feeling a little bit worried about this opening uh, story because it really showed my age, but then I came this morning and heard about a family who had a slideshow last night So, um, with the old click-clacky slide projector, so I'm not feeling so bad today. One of my favourite stories as... Well, I'm going to just put it outright. It's one of my favourite stories, full stop. One of my favourite movies uh, is one that features uh, Jake and Elwood Blues. I love the movie. It is fantastic. It's very quite old now. It's a story of, well, music and ridiculous plot, ridiculous results. It's a romp and it's silly, which is, if you know me, it's right down my alley, really. But it's also a, a movie that dips its toe into some, fairly blatantly, into some themes. The story of the film is the story of a quest or a mission given to Jake by God. He has this divine vision that he's to put a band back together and earn the money in order to save an orphanage from closing. And as you go through, it, presumably this is part of why they get, seem to be indifferent to the most ridiculous things like rocket launches and huge car chases and so on that don't seem to affect them. But this religious language through it is actually quite an interesting one. The two, as young boys, they grew up in that orphanage and returning to it uh, as adults, they mount the stairs up to the uh, office of the nun who heads up the orphanage. They call her the Penguin. And there at the top is a crucifix angled to sort of stare down the stairs. And the way they do the shot as the two come up the stairs is quite an intriguing one because it portrays this figure on the cross as intimidating, as scary. So it plays around with these questions of, um, of God, of God's interest in something as everyday as whether an orphanage can pay its tax bill. And God's work of saving. Well, if you're wondering how on earth we were going to get from the Blues Brothers to the feeding of the 5,000, there's your answer. Because it actually is a passage that explores those very same things. What is, what is God's saviour like? What does it mean for him to save? Is he interested in the, the everyday stuff? How do we respond to a God who saves? We're going to open the next chapter of John's Gospel together. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, reading us as we read it. We thank you that as we open your word, we are confronted by the Lord Jesus. And so we pray that as we read your word, we would see Jesus. We pray that as we read your word, we would hear Jesus. And that as we read your word, we would respond as we should to Jesus. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible at home, it is helpful to have your Bibles open to John chapter 6. Uh, and we're going to have a look at that now. The scene is set in the first few verses 
After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Here's here's John's introduction. This gives us the the bundle of things that we need to know as we come into this, this story. This account. This is actually one of the few accounts that we find in John's Gospel where he's actually done the same thing as Matthew, Mark and Luke. Uh, John often has chosen different accounts, different things to retell. He tells you at the end of his book that he's been quite selective. He's picked things that he wants to do and he hasn't. He's chosen not to record other things. In fact, he says, if I was to try and put everything down that Jesus did, I wouldn't have a book big enough to put it in. So he's chosen what to record, and often he chooses to record things that the other gospel writers don't. But here is a case where, he, where all four gospels have this event. It seems to be a particularly important one, a particularly significant one. And John actually gives us a few details that the other gospel writers didn't. So there they are, they've crossed, uh, Jesus is in Galilee, but he's crossed the sea to uh, the other side, the other side uh, presumably from Capernaum, so he's now in uh, actually a different part of Galilee, a part that was under a different rule. A large crowd has followed him, excited, anticipating. Jesus goes up on a mountain to sit down with his disciples, but they keep following him. And we're told that the Passover is at hand. And we're going to look at a fair bit of that as we go on, but for the moment, let's read on. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. There's a big crowd. We're told that there are 5,000 men in this crowd, and that doesn't count the women and children. So this is a very big crowd. And Philip says, look, if I, gave, if I were to get together 200 days' wages, two-thirds of a year of wages, and go down and try and buy out every bread shop in town, I couldn't feed these guys. One of his disciples, Andrew... Simon Peter's brother said to him, well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? He's found some food. Uh, It's not a lot, though. It is something, um, to give you an idea, often when we think of a loaf of bread, we think of something that's, you know, big and gets sliced up and you can make sandwiches for a family for quite a while, depending on how fussy you Kids are about what constitutes stale bread. These are obviously these are smaller. This is this is the Middle East, so we're probably talking flatbread. But we also know that uh, three pieces of bread of that kind of size is is, is actually what you would feed a person with. Uh, we know that from Luke 11. Um, Jesus tells a, uh, is giving an illustration. And he says, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. So this kid, he doesn't have this little, you know, tiny pocket of... There's, there's not no food here. It's not a small, tiny, pitiful amount of food 
but it ain't going to go around 5,000 people. And it certainly isn't going to go around 5,000 men, plus women, plus children, in this huge crowd. The disciples, Jesus' followers, have been on view through John's Gospel as, in in a sense, John's been helping us to to sit there and think through, well, how are the disciples seeing Jesus? As Jesus displays who he is, what do the disciples of Jesus do with that? And so uh, the, one of the first things we're introduced to is this idea of the, the disciples and their understanding of Jesus because he puts out there that question, how are we going to feed them, knowing what he's planning on doing? And we're told it was a test. And I think we can presume fairly comfortably that uh, Philip's response uh, was not passing the test. He seems to be thinking very much in terms of Jesus, uh, of the practicalities that anybody would face. How much money do I need? Where do I get it from? How far is the nearest shop? The kind of things we would be thinking about in terms of this kind of thing, but they've already had some glimpses about who is in their midst. Andrew is really not that much better. He finds a young boy who's got some food. He brings him to Jesus and says, look, we found some. But really, um, there's enough for you. Um, That's about it. They're thinking very much in terms of what could I do as the limits of what he can do. And isn't that actually an easy thing for us to do with God? To think that any solution of God's has to be the kind of solution I'd come up with? As I'm worried about something, I work out the scenarios. This could happen or that could happen. Which one? Lord, can you help me do one of these? Here is the way it works. Here is the way I would do it. Here is the way I see One of the problems we have is when we have a small saviour, a God who can only think as big as we can. I think one of the breathtaking things about the Bible is its clear teaching that God's not like me. Because like Andrew and like Philip, I can get very caught up in what I can do and what I can't do. And God isn't like me. He has bigger plans, he has bigger ways of working, and he can do things in ways that we don't imagine. A number of people came into this year, particularly around March, were wondering what is going to happen, how is the future going to work, what is going to to be done in this about how we connect together. Particularly in churches, a lot of people were anxious. What are we going to do when we actually can't meet? And we grabbed at a few ideas. But quite frankly, God has taken things in directions I never thought he would. We can sit there and say, well, okay, I I, I guess we can go to a video. Who'd have thought that God would use that video connection to reach more people than we normally did on a Sunday rather than less? Who'd have thought it? Who'd have planned it? Isn't it terrible when we make God so small that he can only do what I can do? Well, if that's how the characters of the disciples are portrayed in this passage, let's look at the main figure in our passage. Let's look at Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. 
Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, and also the fish, as much as they wanted. Now, here is Jesus giving food out. And we're told that out of this very small amount of food, Jesus gives to a huge crowd as much as they wanted. Now, the events here, we're told, have a setting. Do you remember it back from verses 1 to 4? It was in verse 4. We were told by John that the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, this is an interesting one because often John will tell us what feast is on. What feast is happening at the time. Here he's saying, there's actually a feast just about to happen. We're just before it, but we're coming really close. Now, Passover is a very important feast. It's the time when the Jews would remember... God's incredible rescue of his people out of slavery in Egypt. How he carried them, how he uh, parted the Red Sea so that they could go through. How he brought judgment on the land of Egypt. How he rescued them and how he provided for them. It reminds them of what God did in rescuing his people. And now, just as the Passover is coming close, Jesus does something that sets off echoes of those events back in the Exodus. This is from Exodus 16. When the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground, When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. So not only is he, Jesus, in a, in a wilderness setting and providing food for a multitude. But we're told he's providing enough that each person has their fill. It sets off those echoes. Here is one who responds to the need of the people in front of him just as God responded to the need of his people bringing them out of Egypt. But in a sense, the, you know, as they say on the old infomercials, but wait, there's more. Verse 12 of chapter 6. When they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. This one may be a little bit less well known to you. But this is not the first time we hear of somebody taking barley loaves and feeding people who the barley loaves shouldn't be able to feed and having leftovers at the end. 2 Kings chapter 4. A man came from Barshalish, Shalisha, sorry, bringing the man of God, Elisha, bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, there they are, and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, Give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, Give them to eat, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them, and they ate, 
and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. And here is Jesus not only providing food like Moses did in the wilderness, not only feeding uh, a number of people with an insufficient supply like Elisha did, but the abundance is greater and the crowd is greater. It's now 5,000 men and there's 12 baskets left over. This is an abundant response. Now I just want to pause for a second and get you to think through this. See, sometimes we can actually get a very different view. If we talked about before the idea that God is limited to what I can think and imagine, sometimes we actually do a different thing with God and we make God the one who is only thinking about the things that are of great earth-shaking, eternal value. It is all about the pie in the sky by and by when you die. God is there to um, kind of make happy so that when I die, I can go to heaven. God's concern is about heaven. And in the meantime, all I'm doing is trying to make God happy enough that when it comes to going to heaven, I'll, I'll get a ticket. If before we saw the problem of a small saviour, this is the problem with a purely spiritual saviour. Because Jesus saw a crowd following him. And his first response, although he is deep, we know from reading through the Gospels, his great concern is that they hear the incredible truths of the good news of the kingdom of God that they come to understand who he is and what he has done, yet his compassion goes out to them and he feeds them. The fact that they are hungry and unable to access food matters. And he responds to that need with abundance. God is not indifferent to the day-to-day. He is not a God who is only interested in the things that go on for eternity. He is, but he's not only. He is a God who is concerned about the day-to-day. Psalm 8 in the Old Testament has a, a, a wonderful picture of God. Uh, I always like to think that, uh, that as, as David wrote it, he was kind of gazing up at the night sky and pondering things after dinner. Mostly because I thought about this psalm when I was after dinner and gazing up at the night sky. And I thought, this kind of works. I like this. And looking out at the stars and thinking about the God who'd made them all and thinks, you know, wow, that's a big God and I'm a small me. How could a big God be interested in a small me? Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. When I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you should care for him. And the language of the psalm it, it's, it's, it's almost a. Like David is gobsmacked because he realizes that that God who is big, who made the stars, who set them all in place, that God who is so huge, is actually concerned. He cares for, he, the word it uses is he attends to us, he, he looks after our needs. It is incredible that the Lord of the universe, the creator of all things, should actually care about the day to day. The little stuff that is in our world. You know that thing that we can sometimes get where we where we feel like there's a there's an issue we shouldn't bother somebody with. You know, this is just a trivial thing. I shouldn't bother them with it. And we can end up kind of putting that on God. This is just a trivial thing. I, I I shouldn't bother. Actually, God loves to be bothered. God loves us to reach out to him in dependence. To be 
can, to, to, to ask him to be involved in our day to day, to know that he is a God who is big enough, cares enough, is concerned enough about what you're dealing with right now, what you're dealing with tomorrow, that he, this is something he wants to be a part of. Don't lock God into a purely spiritual saviour. Well, we've looked at how John kind of portrays the disciples, at, at how, what, what happens when we encounter this incredible Jesus who is concerned for the day-to-day, but uh, responds to that day-to-day in, in an abundance that is incredible. What about the third, if you like, character of this story, that big mass character called the crowd? What happens with the hungry crowd? Well, we know that there was a crowd following Jesus. But we know some things about the crowd that John sets us up for. This is not a crowd who are following Jesus because they think that here is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one in whom they will find life the one that we've been encountering as we've read through John's Gospel. No, these are people who've come because here is a source of abundant and ultimately free health care. A large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. This is great. Now, some of them may have been there for the, hoping that they might be healed, but somebody they know might be healed. Others may be there because they're wondering what Jesus' ability to heal might mean. So we don't know from that statement alone that, these are, that they're a fickle crowd. Uh, they are, we're going to find that out, but we don't know that from that alone. As we go on, though, what do we encounter? Well, we encounter a moment of realisation, don't we? In verse 14... Having seen this abundant uh, provision for the need of the crowd, John tells us when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And you may be tempted at this point to go, wow, they're on the money. Because that's exactly who he is. Uh, The language there, the prophet who was to come into the world, is a a reference to a a, a passage in Deuteronomy where God talks about raising up a prophet like Moses. And so there was an expectation that a prophet like Moses would come and that the the Messiah, the the promised king, would also be a, a, a prophet. And would come in that kind of uh, ruling prophet mode. Because you remember Moses wasn't just a prophet of God. He was also the leader of God's people. So one who would do that be both prophet and leader. This came to be the expectation. The, the messianic hope. And as we think about John's purpose in writing. That you may know that Jesus is the Christ. The Messiah. The Son of God. Surely this is a good sign. The people have realized that that's who he is. Except, of course, they haven't quite. Because what's the next thing we read? Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Literally, they were going to come and seize him. Take him down to Jerusalem, put him on the throne, boot out those silly Romans, hooray for us. They were happy with the idea that Jesus might be this Messiah, but they had their terms for what that Messiah would look like. And here we come to our third problem. We've looked at the problem of a small saviour, the problem of a 
purely spiritual saviour. Now we get the problem of a subservient saviour. One who can be brought to our agendas. Somebody who serves us in our way according to the script we write. Somebody who's going to care about the things that I care about and is not going to care about the things I don't care about. Somebody who's going to make the world into what I want it to be. And friends, it's, it's a danger for us. In fact, often the, the struggle that people find when they approach Christianity is when Jesus turns out not to be that figure. Not to be the one who's here to do what my agenda says should be done. And when they realise that Jesus isn't going to be who they think he should be, they can turn and leave and become disgruntled and sad. Friends, there's a reason that Jesus is addressed as the Lord. He's been shown again and again, and John's by no means finished. He's got plenty more chapters to repeat it, and he will. This is God in the flesh. This is the one who is sovereign over the universe. This is one who, in the words of Paul, before whom every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is Lord. You cannot be a subservient master, a subservient saviour and Lord at the same time. So as we think about Jesus as saviour, as the one who rescues, as we think about the one who has uh, come into this world. Jesus is not a small saviour, limited to the outcomes that we're limited to. We actually have a saviour who, in the words of Paul, can do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. And that is good news. That is breathtakingly good news. Jesus is not just a spiritual saviour, purely concerned with the pie in the sky by and by when you die. He is concerned about our day to day. He wants us to trust him and to entrust our concerns to him. Paul says that at the end of Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. With prayer and petition, thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Because you've entrusted your anxiety, your concern to the one who is in control, the one who is sovereign and who cares about the day-to-day, who cares about what you care about, who cares about you. He's not a small saviour. He's not a spiritual saviour. And he's not a subservient saviour. To be used for our ends, in our ways, he is the sovereign Lord to whom we need to come for life. As we read John's Gospel, we are confronted with Jesus. And that is something that is both wonderfully encouraging and quite challenging. Jesus is the one who comes and brings life and abundance. And we see that in this chapter. But Jesus is also the one who exposes the foolishness in our thinking. Exposes how we can want God to fit our world. Making ourselves the true God. exposes us and challenges us. 
John tells us that as he is recounting, as he's choosing his, uh, the events of Jesus' life to record, that although Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in, these book, in this book, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the one they thought he was. The Son of God, a term that in John gets even bigger than it's uh, than just messianic. This is not just the Son, this is the eternal Son. And that by believing, by entrusting ourselves to Him, we can have life, life that comes from the God who is no small saviour who is no merely spiritual saviour and who is no subservient saviour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in him we can have life. We thank you that in him... We can know the abundance of your love and your care. We thank you that that abundance and that care are not simply limited to eternal matters, but you are the God who cares about all of life. You are the God who is involved in the day to day. We thank you that you are not the one who has sent us a small saviour or just a spiritual saviour or some subservient saviour, a lackey to do our will, but that in Jesus Christ, who is Lord, before whom every knee must bow, we can find life and find it to the full. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.